Hello, and welcome back to another Dutiful Future podcast. Uh, this week, my guest is the wonderful Lucy Martin. Hello, Lucy. Hi. So, Lucy, who are you and what are you here to talk about today? So, um, I'm Lucy. I'm in my second year doing history at Warwick, and I'm the life start editor for The War. I'm here to talk about my articles that I've written about art and its role in politics. Yep, today we're taking a nice little break from the end of the world uh, and we're going to be focusing on art and specifically its relation with politics. So um, Lucy, if you don't know, obviously she just said she's the editor for the the new editor for The Ball Lifestyle. Check that out. And she also has a wealth of articles on pretty much every topic I could I could uh, try and find. <laughs> I was going to you had over like six pages of articles on The Ball. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> a lot of articles. So I, I managed to pick two out of the uh, out of the gold mine that is the content. Uh, so today's episode is going to be on... Um, art and politics so beginning with sort of arts role and protest pieces and then moving into uh issues of censorship so the first article that um we'll be talking about that is he uh, is he for some reason that lucy has written uh was about um the role of protest art in the middle east um so lucy what inspired you to write specifically about protest art in the middle east um i guess for me i've always been quite interested in like the middle east and i'll try to take modules that are about the history of the Middle East and when I saw this pitch I thought it was quite good because we don't often get pictures for the art section that are outside the West and like Europe and America so it was quite nice to have something a bit different and it's something that I didn't know anything about mm. and as I was researching it I kind of realised that there was a lot of stuff and there's like this rich culture of protest art in the Middle East that a lot of people don't know about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, for reference, I guess the protest art, if for a UK, um, I guess like comparison would be basically. I think the most famous one would be Banksy, I guess. Is yeah, point, which is that those sort of issues where it's it is a a piece of art attempting to uh, critique or expose an issue in politics or an established system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one thing I found particularly interesting about the article was you're pointing out saying it's very rare that we ever pay any attention to a form of art form outside of. Um, our own country and in my own research as well uh, I found a, a, a lot of um, very interesting protest pieces mm-hmm. um, so one area in which you specifically pointed out had a lot of art around it was the, uh, the Palestinian, Palestinian conflict um, so and you described it as uh, as an art around this area as de- uh, playing a role in helping build a sense of identity and national pride for people from and living uh, in Israel and Palestine respectively uh, so what did you mean by this what is this role in creating an identity so it kind of started in like the 1940s and 50s, originally from people from Israel, who military people, soldiers, um, people who were quite passionate about the Israel cause used art to express their identity. It was sort of like quite military style pieces. And then throughout time, the Palestinians started to create pieces which were expressing like the situation that they're in. And it sort of became a way for them when they were so repressed to express an identity that they weren't able to express through like politics and other means um yeah so one of the pieces you um, brought up specifically um, was Ishmael Shemout's uh, Where To, which depicted a displaced Palestinian family. Um, I would encourage everyone to Google this piece. If I'm not too lazy, I might put it on screen right now if you're on YouTube. Um, it's a, it's quite a powerful piece. And it, it, as I said, it depicts a family who is attempt, who's been displaced and attempted to find uh, a new home. Uh, what effect do you think these sort of art pieces have um not only domestically uh, in Palestine uh, slash, you know, I guess, Israel, but also for the rest of the world in viewing these these conflicts? I think art like this makes the cause known to the rest of the world and it makes it more powerful because people read statistics on Twitter and on the internet about Palestinians that have been killed, Israelis that have been killed, the conflict going on, and people don't often understand the human side of the conflict. And art like this really hammers it home that people, they're not just of people that are across the world that are completely unrelated to us they're real people and they're experiencing like really horrible things and I think art hammers that home to the rest of the world more so even more powerfully than domestically because people in Palestine are aware of what's going on but I think that's the effect that it has internationally um so what would you say is um so you talk about you hinted on it there but so uh, how effective do you think is these this sort of art pieces in terms of, I guess, humanizing in a sense? You know, people if they look at the news and they hear about how many deaths in in Palestine, how many deaths in Israel, they often just sort of disregard it. Um, do you think that art of this form plays a big role in sort of making a human connection to these to these lives and to these deaths that they see? Yeah, definitely. I think especially when you're reading it on the news or reading it on Twitter, you often 
just assume that it's part of like a war or a conflict but when you see um a painting of a family and like children and like people's wives and then you kind of think well if this is a, a war or a conflict but there's actually people that aren't choosing to be involved that are being killed and I think it really sort of hammers it home that that could be your family and like just because they're across the world doesn't mean that they're completely in a different environment so what would you say to someone who uh would say well um what's the point of of this sort of art in a sense where like everyone knows that these sort of conflicts are happening you know uh, everyone has google everyone has the news we all know how many deaths there are and who it's affecting uh what further role can uh art in this sense play um i think yeah definitely a lot people are more aware of like conflicts across the world and i'm not saying that people the art like makes people aware of it but i think it really does make it more emotional and more of like a make people feel more sympathetic and empathetic because when you're just reading like a conflict that seems so far away then you just kind of think like what can I do how can I help but then when you see art like this you think by buying copies of this that have been made from the artist by visiting exhibits that are where stuff like this is put on then that's how you can sort of help these people and also just make it it does make it more emotional and hammers it home. Yeah, I think the uh, the point of empathy really um, is a strong one when, you know, a lot of people, when they see the news and they see these sort of events, they sort of disregard them where if it is uh, a piece of art in whatever form, there is that sort of personal connection, yeah. uh, which feels to form a form of building up of um, empathy. Um, there's a, a a rapper, I know, slightly off topic, called, um, I think it's Flip Flipter or something like that. I can never, I'm never sure what his name is, mm-hmm. but he did a, um, he, he is a Sudanese uh, rapper and um, he has a lot of, um, a lot of his lyrics and a lot of his songs are around uh, the Palestinian conflict and also conflict in his own country. Uh, and a lot of his success has been born out of people listening to his lyrics or just seeing his performance and then having this sort of direct line of uh, connection. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you think that art has its own unique role in building up a, uh, a personal connection uh, across borders in a sense? Yeah, I think definitely because it's not even just physical art, like, like you say, like music, poems, literature, anything like that it makes things more than just a conflict between governments and something for governments to deal with, the army to deal with. It makes it something that you need to be aware of and it makes it something that you become passionate about and interested in and empathetic towards. And I think it, the, the biggest thing is it just humanises it. And when you can see like a physical painting photo of a family that's been displaced, then you kind of you realise the human consequences more than just statistics and names written on a page. Mm -hmm. So we brought up one of the points there, I guess, of art in this sort of political um, or protest um, context, and this being to get basically get a message out beyond one's own country. But um, do you think it plays a a role uh, domestically? So, for example, Banksy's work is all, most of it is like domestic in a sense, or um, let's say in terms of um, in any country, really, in a a sense of protest, does art play a role in... uh, I guess domestic protest in any form, whether it be, I guess, a like a rallying cry for citizens or sort of something to unify people or a motivational tool. Do you think it can have any impact in this area? I think it can do all of those things. So the thing with Banksy is he really does highlight social injustices and inequalities when a lot of people might not be aware or like see it on the surface. So like the painting he did at Christmas in Birmingham with the reindeer of the homeless man, physically seeing that that's homelessness is such an issue in cities like Birmingham it really brought the issue to people's attention and I think it, it was the reason that it cre- increased so many like donations mm-hmm. to homeless charities over Christmas this year and then in terms of um like as a motivational tool and stuff like that I think people that are using it as like I don't want to say propaganda but as sort of like the symbols mm-hmm. of their movement and stuff like that I think it does help more people get involved because it makes it seem more makes people more passionate and makes it seemed more like real, I guess. So you could say that um, one area where art would play a great role is a, uh, a unifying banner. So it's sort of by, even if it's just something like a symbol, it creates a, uh, a yeah, something to unify a group. Exactly, yeah. an identity. Yeah. Um, there was an interesting article I read about this subject where it basically tried to make the argument that um, protest art has 
pretty much zero impact except in one area and that area was in terms of historical context so mm-hmm. it argued that it would do nothing at the time no matter what but when you look back at history 100 years later and you see these sort of um protest pieces like pieces of art that were against sort of the grain i guess um it signifies a, a sense of disagreement so for example um there is a uh What's it called? A display, and well, there was a display in the Tate Modern about art in the in the peri- after the period of Weimar Germany, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of this was, I guess, protest art against sort of the rising inequality and the horrible conditions people had to live in right back then. And what th- uh, it was argued that this display told was that people weren't happy with what was being done and what was being led up to. Um, do you think that uh, art plays protest art um, plays a very strong role in terms of? historical context or in terms of sort of establishing a disagreement or is it much more about the here and now i think there's sort of two parts to that so i think in that in those sort of situations historically we can look back on people that individually or collectively use protest art to sort of express their discontent at social problems political problems economic problems but then also we do there's the danger of using at the time if it wasn't an important like symbol or piece of art to a movement and then retrospectively saying that that was the reason people joined or like um a key part if it wasn't but I think definitely looking back historically protest art can be an important way of seeing how people deal with problems in society so there was a great quote from your article which was that um art can uh, articulate what may be unspeakable experiences so what did you actually what did you specifically mean by this what the, what, what do you mean by art as an ability to uh, articulate unspeakable experiences so i also wrote an article about how palestinian authors have been using sci-fi to express what they see the future of palestine to be and I think that's a really good example of how art can be used to express what they're not allowed to talk about because there's so much censorship and there's so much political and like literary and like oppression around what they're allowed to say and I think it allows people alternative means of expressing their opinions and their thoughts when a regime might not allow them to do this or even if they are allowed to do it it's still a way for them to express their discontent in another way. So do you think there is a link between um, what we were just talking about where art can represent a symbol or a unifying force for people uh, and also this sort of unspeakable experience in that um, there can be people who they don't, as you said, they can't really, ex- they can't find up the words to express themselves in a specific mm-hmm. manner, but through a through the means of art in whatever form, they can see what someone else creates and they go, oh, that's what I'm feeling or that's what I'm thinking, that's what I want. Um do you think that this sort of unspeakable experience, as you as you put it, uh, is what is what can also play a factor in unifying people uh, through art? Yeah, definitely. I think, especially in the situation like the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, when people have experienced such horrific events and they feel like they can't articulate that because it's too traumatic and um, they just don't know how to. I think art can definitely act as a unifying thing where people have had that shared experience and they can appreciate a piece of art or they feel like their experience has been reflected in a piece of art and they feel like they, they've had their voice heard almost. Mm-hmm. So how successful do you think protest art can be in the here and now? So I'm sure if my dad was listening to this, he would say, oh, you all of this art rubbish, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't actually make a difference. Um, so do you think that protest art can uh, really make a real difference at in a time, or is this something where it is just a a coping mechanism or something just to, just to sort of attempt to get words out there, but struggles to actually make um, real differences? Um, I think that it's becoming something that increasingly affects people, and like photography and symbols used and art that is coming out of protest movements is becoming impactful but there's been obviously the Israeli-Palestine situation is still going on Mm -hmm. but that comes back to the issue of people in this country don't know a lot about Middle Eastern art um but the support that that art had across the Middle East the solidarity between people of different countries that had experienced the same sort of situation I think that can be powerful in itself because the people that create the art know at least that they've had some sort of message and some sort of impact. But 
in terms of being properly politically successful it hasn't been mm-hmm. but i don't know whether that was the aim of it in the first place so what so would you say that the aim is purely awareness or when these pieces are being created it is about trying to get to this goal or is it purely saying please pay more attention this is a real problem um i think a lot of it is about awareness especially Mm -hmm. for something like the the palestinian conflict they want people to know exactly what's happened to the families and people that have been displaced and the horrific things that have happened but it depends on the piece i mean some would be to make a proper political change might have been presented in like a case or something i don't know and then um i think in some situations it might just be for the author or the artist to just express how they're feeling and to represent how like all art like because it all has a different purpose if that makes sense so i specifically asked this question because um when i was doing my research and i was trying to think of examples there there there's so many um things that i could i could draw on where um there was an art piece or a song or a play which which was created far before a horrific event in history. I mean, mm-hmm. for example, um, Israel Shamal's painting that we were talking about earlier, that was made in, was it 1950, I want to say? I think it was 53, yeah. Yeah, which is which is a, a long time before a lot of people in at least the West started really paying a lot of attention to uh, this these sort of issues. Um, or, for example, uh, there's a play called The Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui by um, Bertolt Brecht, and that was about um, the rise of Hitler to power. Um, and he, because the um, Bertolt Brecht, he fled Germany when he saw Hitler coming to power, mm-hmm. and he made this play as a way to tr- attempt to warn uh, the U.S. and say, "This is a massive problem. This guy's going to, you know, this guy's coming to power." Um, and every time, their words seem to be ignored. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess my question would be, why do you think that public, a lot of people in the public, or a lot of people tend to tend to ignore these sort of very powerful art pieces which have been seen to be either spot on or very or very at least successful in demonstrating a real problem i think it just comes down to the fact that art and literature and music is was not originally made in most people's minds for um warning people expressing real problems in a lot of people's minds they just see it as like an artistic outlet as like fiction or not true about or like made up so they don't tend to take it seriously or they see it as an exaggeration or like overly dramatic so they might not take it seriously in that sense do you see that as a problem with i guess um society as a whole where we see um like the arts as purely a an entertainment um medium rather than a system of real political expression um i'd say yeah i'd say well there's nothing wrong with seeing the arts as a form of entertainment and like Mm -hmm artist expression and especially now so many people have turned to the arts for like a release and a stress relief and something to do but this doesn't mean that we shouldn't take artists and writers and photographers seriously when they're expressing real issues because there's literally so much more I would say there's more art nowadays that speaks to social economic and political issues and there there is that's just there for expression so also in your article, um, there was an interesting quote, which was that um, art transgresses uh, borders. Um, so in this quote, do you is this is this a further statement upon the sort of power of art as a as a messaging system? Um, and is this something that you think has been as it been able to be increased in recent years? Um, so for example, you know as as we, we talked about earlier, there was things like you know people would say that oh, we have the internet and we know about all these issues. Um, do you think that art has a similar power in being able to reach a lot more people than something like the news where it's considered to be you know, less exciting yeah definitely i think especially with like instagram twitter facebook people um see art more on a daily basis and especially now with all these virtual art exhibitions that people can look around it's much more accessible to a lot of people than i think reading the news is or watching the news especially people like our age um, and i think in terms of it helping to transgress borders if we were reading literature that was written in Palestine about the Palestinian conflict, it wouldn't be in English. And that would be Mm -hmm. something that English people would not read then, or they would struggle to read. But I think art, it doesn't have it because it's not based around a language because it's so visual. It means that it's accessible to anybody. So um, for why art could potentially be ignored and a lot of things like that. So for example, you know, Shemout's painting from the 19, from 1953, um, 
so long ago where this crisis is is, is increasingly uh you know large and all encompassing um these sort of warnings are often unheard uh do do you think that potentially what this is is um people seeing art as like not a practical medium so they they hear about a painting or something like that, they hear about a crisis and they go oh art is the last thing that i would think is important to come from this um what would you say to someone who um would argue that oh someone in who's a part of this crisis are affected by it making an art piece is a totally total waste of time there's much better things they could be doing to either help out or spread awareness I completely get that because I think that's a wider issue with art in general. People see it as quite elitist and they see it as a waste of time and they see it as inaccessible and not able to change anything. But I'd say that the people in these situations that are using art as a form of expression, they're using it because they feel like it's the most effective means to get across their point, raise awareness or express themselves. And they're not able, they might not be able to express themselves in any other way. And the fact that they've chosen to use art as a form of expression, we should take seriously and we shouldn't dismiss it as something that, oh, it's just an art piece that I don't want to look at. Mm-hmm. So do you think that um, uh, one of the potential reasons why art is often ignored or less known about or not seen to be as, like a, I guess, a political, politically revolutionary force is due to interference so your other article was about um censorship of art in the lgbtq community um but specifically in relation to protest art still do you think that there there, there is uh, a push by governments to sort of censor art so for example um i believe there was um there was some censorship of there's been censorship of palestinian art for you know as you as you brought up earlier for, for years mm-hmm. uh is this sort of government censorship and suppression something which is limiting the impact of of protest pieces i think in many ways protest art is one of the few things in a lot of situations that gets past censorship so social media the internet um allows a lot of people to share things that in previous years they wouldn't have been able to get across and i think in these sorts of we shouldn't generalize first of all that like there's not censorship in all of these but like in these sorts of situations if they tried to speak out uh, on a political platform if they tried writing letters or going onto an international news platform, then they would be censored in that way. So I think by doing art, governments, if also it depends how they distribute it, if they're distributing it domestically and the state aren't aware of it or groups aren't aware of it, then I think it can be, a lot of, in a lot of ways, a way to get around censorship. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, a lot of people, when they hear about censorship of art, they would, they would immediately think, oh, that, that's a dystopian thing, that's from mm-hmm. years ago. But um, from from your article and also from you know my own very brief research, uh, there is a wealth of um, examples of art being censored across the world. Mm-hmm. And if there's one thing I learned, it's that uh, the United States of America really oh, yeah. loves censoring art. Mm-hmm. Um, they really don't like art in in about a, a, a range of topics. So your article specifically about LGBTQ. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, there was a nice happy Venn diagram middle where a lot of the LGBTQ art we were talking about was essentially protest pieces because most of it was about um uh i guess attempting to um attack societal norms around Mm -hmm. these sort of issues um and so one of the pieces that um i believe you mentioned was irreverent a celebration of censorship uh which was a basically a collection of um censored lgbt uh q art uh do you think that there has been a societal push across the world to try and censor specifically these sort of protest arts by governments or is this sort of a thing where it's uh it's the 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 excuse for the museum what they say like oh it's for civility or it's it's vulgar um is that generally the reason or is this a a i guess coordinated push against these sort of art pieces um i don't think it's a coordinated push against these art pieces by different governments sort of like working together I think in America a lot of the cases is they felt like the museums themselves felt like the public would be offended and they couldn't sort of take the art that was on display but then there's also the situation that this art may have been put in countries where it was illegal still to be gay um in which case it is a coordinated thing across governments because they don't want any discussion of it. They don't want people to understand it even better because they're scared that people will then not have a problem with it, like if they normally do. Um, but I think especially in America, museums feel like they'll lose sales and that people won't appreciate the topics that more controversial, in quotes, artists and are going to 
put on but I think it depends really on the country and the situation but I think it is sort of a mixture of both so could you say that specifically in terms of America, um, this could be seen as sort of a wider issue with commercialization of art. So where a controversial piece or one that goes against the grain or is a protest piece uh, would is is one which you know wouldn't make money and therefore not be be I guess mm-hmm. supported by a museum. Is this a problem with with I guess the art world in general uh, in terms of commercialization? I think um, there's still a lot of directors of museums galleries exhibits who push for this like controversial art because that's what they want to show and there's a big market for like more edgy controversial art that covers issues like censorship but there's still a lot of traditional museums that would prefer to have like traditional art pieces which are still controversial in themselves they just sort of take it for granted that it's accepted that it's okay but yeah I think especially somewhere like America where they know that people won't go to those sort of controversial exhibits they don't want to lose money and they don't want to risk putting their reputation as a museum on the line if they think that a controversial exhibit is going to make their reputation worse Mm -hmm. so um one of the uh, main points of your article was that um art can play a powerful role in uh tearing down stigma and stereotypes around various different issues um how powerful and in what ways um would art be able to play a role in tearing down the stigma, these stigmas and stereotypes? So to elaborate on, like, how effective could this potentially be? I think the thing is with LGBT art, a lot of people that have stigma about gay people um, and LGBT, the LGBT community are often scared and they don't understand it. Um, and for whatever reason, they haven't been educated on it the sex education that people receive in different countries doesn't talk about LGBT relationships a lot of the time. So I feel like art has a way of educating people, tackling issues that we don't see in schools and we don't see from like the state and on TV a lot of the time in film often. So I feel like art can make people more aware so that then they don't have that stigma. That's an interesting point we haven't really touched on yet, which is that um, art can play a really powerful role like, in in this sort of education and awareness. Because mm-hmm. um, you, uh, you know, you brought up specifically with LGBTQ, a lot of the issue is that they don't understand it or mm-hmm. that, you know, they're 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 ignorant to the concept. Where art has a uniquely digestible, um, art is lucky in being a uniquely digestible medium, yeah. which can I guess percolate through people with uh, a particularly sort of I guess a wall up of um, of ignorance. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, America has a long history of censoring art, and even as you know, as very recently, there's like a long tradition of um, museums and like council buildings uh, having art pieces altered. So a, a, a classic example of this is there are loads of paintings of American settlers basically massacring Native Americans. Mm-hmm. It's a common joke in TV shows like Parks and Recreation, for example. Um, and the main excuse they use when they change this is they say, oh, it's because the art is vulgar or it is, it's distasteful, mm-hmm. rather than uh, in a way of rebuffing accusations of, oh, what you're doing is you're trying to rewrite history, you're trying to make it look all friendly, uh, yada, yada, trying to basically you know, tidy up American history. Mm-hmm. Um, so would you say you agree with the point that um, the excuse of um a lot of people when they say oh we, we, we don't like this art because it is it's vulgar or or it's you know it's inappropriate um mm-hmm. is one often masked for politically political gain or for ter- or in, in this specific case uh, in aims of rewriting history i think that's definitely the case so i made the point in this article about how people censored lots of exhibits about like gay sex and different portrayals of sex that aren't on the national curriculum because they said it was too vulgar but then you see Michelangelo's David and you see traditional like Renaissance and Greek piece sculpture pieces which are just like the same level of nudity so I think it is people are being hypocritical when they say that it's vulgar but then they'll show other sorts of things and it's clearly not nudity they have an issue with they're just saying that because they want to um they have a political motive behind it like in the same way that you're talking about with like the Native American thing it's Mm -hmm. the same thing where they just don't want to they don't want to address the truth so that they'll be hypocritical in saying that it's vulgar or it's offensive or it's showing too much nudity and stuff like that so rather than actually have the discussion that the art is attempting to provoke 
they are uh, trying to use yeah trying to use um, excuses of civility and inappropriateness to mm-hmm. sort of skirt past it. Um, yeah. One piece uh, I know that, I, that I believe you might have brought up in your article, or it might have been my own research, I can't mm-hmm. remember. It was called uh, Hide and Seek, Difference and Desire in American uh, Portraiture. And what this was basically is a uh, a piece of art depicting a cross covered in ants. Mm-hmm. And it was specifically in reference to the AIDS crisis. And it was very heavily censored in an American museum. And the, uh, the artist um, uh, made... The point when it was it basically highlighted on this point of, hypocr- uh, of hypocrisy, highlighted the the inherent hypocrisy in this museum's decision to censor his art, mm-hmm. making the point that art has always been about protest. It's always been inherently political. It's always trying to make a message. It's always trying to be provocative. Um, would you say you agree with this point that that there is there is a sense of hypocrisy in trying to censor a lot of art pieces because one of the very notions of art is to critique or is to provoke or is to I guess offend and shock people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in the situation of that painting, you know, there's religious iconography paintings from the Renaissance and like before that and all throughout history that are in really famous museums in America and Europe and across the world. And they don't have an issue with them because the modern, they don't fit modicum political problems and they're not worrying to society or the government, so they just leave them. Whereas something like the AIDS crisis where the American government massively messed up and they don't want to address the fact that they did things wrong and it's also it's like the museum don't want to put that on because they're scared that like people will find it too crude or don't people don't want to talk about it but it's just hypocritical because there's protest there's religious pieces that protest that are from hundreds of years ago that they have in the museums i'm trying to think back to my about two weeks of studying uh like philosophy of art and aesthetics in mm-hmm. year one philosophy um and the, the 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 great example of this point would be um Duchamp's fountain uh which um was a case where in a there was an art gallery which was basically considered that normal art galleries were far too elitist mm-hmm. and you had to pay a lot of money to get place so they said look we will put anything in our gallery if you just give us like whatever it is the fee to have it up We'll put it in our gallery because we don't we don't think that art is is an exclusive medium. And what Duchamp did under a pseudonym was he basically got a urinal and wrote something on it <laughs> and then tried to submit that. And the <laughs> art gallery rejected it and they said, No, we're not putting this up. Uh, and then that in itself became a performance piece around um hypocrisy in the art world. Um so this has clearly been something that has been around for a long time. And I guess less of the political aspect, but it wasn't one of the same reasons that oh, this is just vulgar or mm-hmm. it is it is inappropriate. Um Another example I found, which was actually quite a, a very recent one, was in 2017. Uh, there was a very, uh, uh, a quite a sudden rule change in Guantanamo Bay, the prison, mm-hmm. um, which was said to say that what even so after a prisoner is released, uh, none of their artwork or anything they write or create can leave the premises, right. because there was a um, very popular exhibit in uh, I can't remember what museum in America, um, which was depicting, which was um, artwork from people who had left Guantanamo Bay and it was depicting the horrible conditions that they were in Um, and this is a story which basically was given zero attention Um, so do you think that this this sort of this is this is a prominent example of uh, a government almost being terrified of art in a sense and and it's sort of power to influence people because this it was in 2017 this was one of the main uh, this was around the time of of a strong push to get Guantanamo Bay shut yeah I think the government are definitely scared of the art, the power that the art can have that the prisoners in Guantanamo Bay produce because it's different when you are listening to one person talk about their experience. Like it's easier for people to ignore that. But when you're seeing official examples of like torture and waterboarding and what's going on in Guantanamo Bay, then it's harder for people to ignore, especially if so many people that were there produce it and they're producing the same sort of images and the same sort of ideas, then that's something that the government would definitely be afraid of because I think it would... I don't know whether it would sway the American public, but I think it would produce an outcry in maybe in other parts of the world. So what would you say that we uh, miss out on when uh, art is suppressed in this way? Um, so, for example, uh, the Guantanamo Bay, Guantanamo Bay piece, it was uh, released in a sense. It, you know, it was, it did, um, it was there, it, it, it was a exhibit for a while. Um, but what is it that we're missing when a government is successful in suppressing these sort of art pieces whether it be lgbtq or whether it be a protest piece of Guantanamo bay so i think 
the biggest thing is we're missing like a human lived experience especially with Guantanamo Bay so it's harder for people to make the case that that needs to be shut down and it's harder for people to sort of understand exactly what's going on because they can't see the art and with the LGBT censorship pieces it's harder for people to educate people that may be more Mm -hmm. ignorant even though it's not their job to educate them but it's harder for it's harder for people to sort of understand what they don't understand and it's harder for people because when you're just explaining something to someone and it's just words it's harder for them to sort of visualize and really understand it Mm -hmm. so do you think that um this sort of uh censorship of art is a another facet of government control so a lot of the time people in the west we we tend to consider our countries to be the ultimate land of the free especially in america However, there are a lot of cases where these sort of um, expressions have been silenced to a massive degree. Um, do you see this sort of censorship as sort of like a minor issue where it's like, oh, it's a shame, you know, they're silencing this person, but it isn't the end of the world? Or is this a massive infringement on rights and a tool of, in a sense, I guess, oppression? I think it is a big issue. And I think it is a tool of oppression because it's controlling what people see and it's controlling how people perceive of society if people don't understand about the AIDS crisis and about Guantanamo Bay and they don't see the art that reflects that, then they can just tune off from the news and the stuff they see on social media and think that the government's doing a good job and that then they don't hold the government to account. And I think it is the amount that it's done. People don't think of Europe and America as um, authoritarian, oppressive Mm -hmm. regimes. They don't see them as censoring anything, but they are censoring art and in, whether it's individual museums or whether it's the government stopping it, it is stopping issues that people want to talk about and want to hold the state to account and society to account about. It is stopping people from accessing that. So earlier on, we had our discussion uh, about how powerful art can be. Uh, and would you say that one of the best, I guess, pieces of evidence for how powerful art can be in protest is the the thousands of cases of it being extremely censored? Yeah, I guess. I mean... They're obviously making a point, the people that are making this art, if it's touching the nerve with the people in control. Mm -hmm. Um, And I guess that is evidence of how powerful it is because people people are scared about it coming out and people are scared about it being available to a mass audience. So what would you say is the the best way for people to, I guess, attempt to fight back against this sort of, excuse me, oppression or or censorship of art? What What is the best way to either support these people or to ensure that you can... Um, I guess uh, absorb these sort of pieces and, and try and absorb this information even just having a quick google search because like I searched Middle Eastern protest art and mm-hmm. it came up with so many articles but you would not see them on the news feed and you wouldn't mm-hmm. see them on social media if you didn't look for them and then if you're really interested in something then look on the website for it if there's an exhibit that's near you or in this country then like maybe go and see it when all this is over, obviously. Mm -hmm. Maybe if they have, like, an online shop, they sell, like, postcards and stuff like that. If you're really passionate about the cause, support it or message the artist or... Mm -hmm. Because I think it's not there, you have to look for it, and that's the most important thing. A lot of people just want things that are just easy to access, but stuff like this, because it is censored or it's not widely known, you do have to, like, search for it. Uh, And... As we spoke about earlier, you know, um, the the power of art informing this sort of personal connection. Um, is this something which, uh, in order to encourage protest pieces and these sort of um, these this art has been repressed, it is important to um, almost make the the consumption of art into a reciprocal relationship and put effort into building a sort of I guess personal connection and a personal empathy with said uh, author or artist. I think that's definitely something that would help. Um... For example, if you see a Palestinian photography piece on a website that's and it's not a particularly popular website, if you reach out to the artist and form a relationship with them, then I'm sure that would make them so happy and feel like their work has been appreciated. And you could help to spread that on social media. If they're spreading it on social media, you could share that for them. But I don't think it's always necessary. I think sometimes just making people aware and educating people on what's going on. And if you're seeing something, you see the the piece about the family from Palestine in the 1950s, and then you're thinking, oh, the next time it comes up in the news and the next time mm-hmm. that you hear something about 
the Israel-Palestine conflict, you could think, is that true? Do I, I need to look more into this? Like, making you, it's the education thing, again, like, making you more aware of what's going on. Mm-hmm. So, what it, what this would be is art has its own unique ability to uh, spread a message in a digestible manner and in a way which can be, I guess, seen by all. It can transgress borders, as you, mm-hmm. as, you uh, as you put it. Um, what would you say to someone who um, they listen to this and they go, all right, mm-hmm. this is all nice and stuff, but art isn't a this it, art isn't a political concept. Where they, what they would say to you, what they would, what would you say to someone who said art isn't uh, as as a as strong as a political force as we think it is? Art is merely an entertainment entertainment piece, and it is something which people will look at and go, oh, that's kind of nice, and then they will move on. Um, how do you convince someone who has this mindset to actually? Um, put effort into absorbing a message of art or trying to actually think of it in more of a I guess practical manner I would say to just even look up some of the pieces that we've talked about in this mm-hmm. podcast just even just have a quick google and look at them and I think the emotion and the empathy that they put across it's hard to ignore that and if like we all have things that we're passionate about if you're look you look at an issue that you're passionate about and see there'll definitely be art related to it I'm sure and then you can see how that art invokes a feeling and then you're more aware of the impact the mm-hmm. art can have. But it's just looking at it. Like if you've never looked at any protest piece, I mean, I'm sure everybody saw the Banksy Memorial mm-hmm. and it's hard to look at that and not feel anything and not see what he's trying to do and not see that homelessness is a real issue. So I think, but people, I don't think people associate protest art with Banksy if you're not thinking mm-hmm. about it. Sure. And if people were more aware of what classes as protest art and that they see it, more often than they think they do, then I think they'd be more aware of the impact it can have. So there could be sort of a disconnect between yeah. pieces like Banksy and then also what people consider to be protest art. Because they mm-hmm. hear the word protest art and they think, oh, that's all artsy, whatever, you know, it's not a, yeah, a real definitely. grounded concept. Where actually they are used to or consume so many pieces. You know, there's, there's a, about a million mainstream movies which are extremely um, political in a sense, whilst not being, you know, I guess. Uh, consider protest art. I mean, for example, one of the most popular ones is like Robocop, which is uh, an extremely political movie about authoritarianism where so many people enjoy it and they watch it, but they don't consider it to be that form of protest, which a lot of people mm-hmm. um, would, in a sense, uh, think. So what would be your 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 conclusion, your summing up of protest art and its importance? And what, what would be your message to to people out there who are listening and thinking, oh, this has been kind of interesting. You know, what is next? I would say just to have a google of any mm-hmm. cause that you're interested in it doesn't have to be palestine it doesn't have to be lgbt censorship and just have a look what protest art is out there and what art people have done to express those sort of issues there's never been a better time now to look on virtual exhibitions of museums that are so accessible mm-hmm. because in the end of the day protest art makes a difference for people that don't have a political voice and mm-hmm. it's a way to express a collective experience that people can't always articulate because it's been so horrific and I think it's not something that you have to be really passionate about you don't have to be really interested in art but just having a look and I'm sure there's at least one image one painting that will stick in your mind because it's so powerful Mm -hmm. so what what you can say is let people um uh let people hear the voices of those who are often Mm -hmm. unheard yeah uh Lucy thank you so much for coming on Thank you for having this me. This has been fantastic. A great, little, uh, great, uh, exciting topic. Definitely a nice break from the last yeah. <laughs> guess, free coronavirus uh, podcast and videos yeah. I've done. Um, right. Uh, everyone follow Lucy on Twitter, uh, at Lucy M. Journo, uh, for more stuff like this. A lot of good book and uh, movie recommendations mm-hmm. uh, on there. And also check out The Boar Lifestyle. It's a yeah, fantastic section definitely. of The Boar. Uh, I still haven't written for it yet, but I will soon. Don't worry, Lucy. Yeah, you better do one soon. <laughs> I'm going to have to. Um, once again, Lucy, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, this has been great. Um, Dual Future is on Spotify and iTunes. Please listen to us there. Thank you very much. Hope everyone enjoyed.